Wisconsin I is in Milwaukee. We're at the state Republican Party convention interviewing Attorney General Brad Schimmel, seeking a second turn on November 6th. You're out of the Capitol. It's a Saturday. You can talk politics. You ready? Yes. And You're the big surprise of the day is I got the endorsement of the party. <laughs> You're not being challenged in a primary, but right. congratulations. Um, your opponent, Josh Koff, the Democrat. Yeah. Let's start. Why is he not qualified to be attorney general? Well, he's never prosecuted a criminal in Wisconsin. I mean, the, the art, they write articles kind of taking his words where they'll put in a uh, prosecutor, they call him. He doesn't have nearly the experience. The challenges we face in Wisconsin in public safety leave us in a position that it's no time to earn while you learn the job. The reason why we're leading in so many public safety things is because when I came to the Department of Justice, I already had the relationships and I had the experience to know how to hit the ground running. I didn't have to, I didn't have to take time to figure out what works and doesn't work. I'd been part of the Wisconsin law enforcement community for 25 years and been part of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And we've been implementing those things, redirecting resources and priorities at DOJ to make some really great things happen for public safety. What progress, what initiatives are you most afraid, Mr. Call, if you were elected, would uh, let slide or dismantle? Well, certainly the work we're doing on human trafficking, the opioid epidemic, the work, the tremendous progress we've made in getting legislative um, enactments done that have helped crime victims, have helped law enforcement be safer. Coming into the next session, um, the sheriffs and chiefs and uh, Wisconsin Professional Police Association and Milwaukee Police Association and I, we're, we've already plotted our course for the things we're going to work on this next coming uh, legislative session to make a difference. We've worked very hard on wellness for law enforcement at DOJ. That's been, that's been one of my signature things we've worked on. It doesn't catch a lot of attention because the general public can't really relate to what we're talking about with this, but law enforcement, prosecutors, social workers, judges, public defenders, all, all of those people in their careers every day, they live kind of in the, the sorrow and suffering of people around them. And it's that the cumulative burden that comes with that is tremendous. We've got the, we've got the only DOJ in America that is sponsoring and coordinating a training program for law enforcement chaplains and we have hundreds over 400 law enforcement chaplains we've trained in Wisconsin and we're supporting them and continuing their training so they can serve law enforcement and their communities even better every day we're doing things like that that frankly I just fear my opponent doesn't even understand the complexities involved in on that in those things and there's no, there's no question there are many people at DOJ who contribute to getting this good work done, but it does take leadership and it does take a leader who understands and can innovate and, uh, and find better ways to solve problems. Your response when Mr. Calls, calls you a, his term, not mine, headline grabbing attorney general, referring to your lawsuit to kill, eviscerate the Affordable Care Act. Your response? Well, the Affordable Care Act is a string of broken promises. It, health insurance is not more acceptable. It is not cheaper. It hasn't made anything easier or better. And it's going to get worse because now that the, now that the U.S. Congress has taken away the tax penalty from the individual mandate, it's, it's not going to keep, it's not going to get anybody doing this because no one's going to buy insurance that's so much more expensive than if the private sector is allowed to just do what it does better than government. So it's all going to collapse on itself. We're, we are out ahead of this to make sure when it collapses, it doesn't leave America w without any solution. And that's why I'm pleased as, as we're doing this, the governor has worked to rebuild our very successful um, uh, high risk pool. Before Obamacare, Wisconsin had a very successful high risk pool. Governor Walker, anticipating the collapse of this, of this system, is rebuilding that. And we're doing things to make sure Wisconsinites are taken care of. Update, uh, update Wisconsinite viewers, what, what exact progress have you made testing the backlog of rape kits, General? Well, we're, we're at the point that very soon we'll have the last of all the kits that are going out for testing at the labs in the process. And this is a problem, this is a problem that's accumulated for over 20 years. 
and we are working to resolve this in three years. And we're doing it in a way that's leading the nation. Frankly, President Obama's Department of Justice praised Wisconsin for the work we're doing on this. As we're the gold standard. This is, this is the model to follow because not only are we getting through these kits effectively and efficiently as best we can, but we're also doing it in a victim-centered way. And that was something unique to Wisconsin at the time and others have copied it. But the problem with this and the problem that my opponent doesn't understand when he says I would have tested them faster, he doesn't understand there's no capacity to test them. You can't take a system that frankly, as we know, crime labs in Wisconsin and across America, as we are getting better at collecting more and more evidence at crime scenes, we're using forensic evidence and science to solve more and more crimes, the crime labs are being stretched to their capacity and the private labs are as well. My opponent doesn't know what he's talking about when he suggests, oh, I would just get them tested. There is no place that can test them faster. And we actually, in our first RFP we put out, to try to get a lab to do this, got nobody interested. We had to go back to Bodie Cellmark Labs and convince them to try to expand their capacity to somewhat to help us. They couldn't, they couldn't do this instantly. And then we went out and we searched out and found two other labs, Sorensen and uh, Marshall University, that we coaxed into this too, to, to, to expand as much as we could. But there is no way to test this faster because you can't take 20 years worth of trouble and dump it on the system all at once and expect it to work. You've worked closely with Governor Walker and Representative Nygren on the opioid, meth, heroin problem. What's the next generation of bills that you can see or the next generation of changes to attack that problem, I to make more of, progress? I think one of the most important things we have to do is address reimbursement rates for all behavioral health challenges. Um, we don't pay people who do mental health work and AODA work well enough to attract enough people into this field. We have got to get more boots on the ground. Right now, especially with AODA, so many of the people doing that treatment work are people in recovery. And they're doing it, they're setting aside that it doesn't pay very well. They're setting that aside because they're giving back out of their gratitude but we need more than that. We need, to, we need to attract more professionals. That's a big piece of it. And on the mental health side, we've got to do better about identifying why do people start abusing drugs. And lots of times, we're looking at kids who are 11 that are starting drinking alcohol, smoking pot, and then by the time they're 13 and 14, they've moved on to more potent, more dangerous drugs. That's why I'm thrilled with uh, the First Ladies um, Ace. Ace's cause, where uh, it's fostering addressing childhood trauma, fostering futures. I think is a program called, and it is looking to address those problems, those traumatic experiences that so many of these kids that go on to be drug abusers later on. We can look back and we can understand what they were doing, what what mental illness problem or emotional problem they were self medicating, or or what things they just are trying to forget in their lives, or what terrible example some grown up in their life has, has given them. There are parents out there who use drugs with their kids. As a former district attorney, let me ask you this. Are we losing talented, qualified DAs and ADAs because of, of, of higher pay in the private sector? I think that's going to get worse. Uh, yeah, we are, we have been for years, and I think that's gonna get worse. For many years, um, kind of the district attorney's best friend was the economic recession. Because when companies start cutting positions in, in the front office, a lot of times they'll, they'll cut some of that lawyer staff. They'll, they'll do less legal work because they've got to cut some costs somewhere. And that was making it harder to find legal jobs. As, as the economy grows, there's going to be more opportunities out there. And I think we'll see more young prosecutors leave. I want to ask you about criticism from one Wisconsin now about your trip to the Alliance Defending Freedom event. Do you regret going to that? Are you going to go to one this year? I hope so. I don't know if it's going to work because of the calendar and election year, but um, I don't regret that at all. What, what one Wisconsin now said is patently false and it never should have made a newspaper article, much less a headline. That event didn't have a single bit of hate at it. As I was there, as I was there, we started the day with an evangelical 
prayer session for an hour, and we ended the day with a Catholic Mass every day. And all through the day, it was all about love. It was all about, about uni unifying people. Um, I'm, if anyone had said anything hateful or derogatory about any human being or about any, any group of Americans or human beings, I would have walked out. This, that, those allegations are all false. And, I'm, and, I, and for having published that, people who did should be ashamed of themselves. Has that group taken a position against LGBT causes? Not that I'm aware of, and they certainly didn't that week. Now, they, they catch criticism about it because it's the Alliance Defending Re, uh, Freedom, and what their, the primary freedoms they defend are religious freedom and speech freedom and expression freedom. And so they catch criticism because no, no one at that, as part of this group, would deny that in America it is now, you have the right to marry whom you, the adult you please. No one's, no one's challenging that, but what they're challenging is the notion that some other American can be forced to do something that violates their conscience. And that's the serious, that's the serious legal debate. And I think that's where the Southern Poverty Law Center comes up with this fake claim that they're a hate group. Simply by representing a cake baker in Colorado, Colorado or a florist in Washington State, um, those things, they're, they're simply standing for that person's right to not violate their own religious conscience. And we aren't, in, as America, we're not allowed to judge what somebody else's religious conscience tells them as long as they don't harm someone else. As, as, a, as a Supreme Court justice once said, and I can't remember which one, your rights end at the tip of someone else's nose. Um, after the special election in Senate District 10, the governor tweeted about a potential blue wave, be on the alert. Uh, a blue wave might defeat the governor, it might defeat you. How, how worried are you of a blue wave? Well, I think we needed the wake up call. I, I don't feel, as, I, as I've been out with voters and, and with Republican activists around the state, for, for many months now. They're on board. Um, you know, I think they took a little bit of a break in the early part of this year, which maybe they deserved. They've been working very hard for many years and it never seems to stop, but they're on board. They get it, they got their wake up call, they heard it, and I think we're gonna be just fine. In your first term, you got added a, a, a office of solic so Solicitor General, excuse me. Why did, why did DOJ need that, General? to be able to attract some really, really high level, capable, intellectual attorneys to our team. We've got great lawyers throughout DOJ, but we would never be able to attract some of the people who clerked for the United States Supreme Court. The people who graduated at the very top of their law school classes, the most brilliant lawyers in America. Well, we have attracted a number of them to DOJ because by creating that specialized office and giving them a mission that they can, they can search out and find the really tough legal battles to take on, but for the right causes. By doing that, I've attracted those people to Wisconsin DOJ, and we have, we don't have the biggest by far, but we have the most potent Solicitor General's office in America because we're the only one that has two former U.S. Supreme Court clerks at it, and we've got three former U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals clerks. These are, those are highly coveted jobs, these people walked away from, from pretty significant salaries to come serve Wisconsin for, I, I can't pay them any, any more really than I pay any other attorneys at the office, but they're willing to come because of, the, because of the reputation that comes from being in that division. If your critics say we should get rid of the Office of Solicitor General, what would DOJ lose? Well, I would lose the ability to hang on to lawyers that can go and argue so effectively in front of the United States Supreme Court, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. I, this, these are lawyers that are so much sharper than the average of us. They're, they're the, they are the very best and brightest among the legal world. Okay. Attorney General Brad Schimmel, thank thanks you for talking to Wisconsin Eye. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a good convention.